So leading us through that, we have futurist extraordinaire Trista Harris, who is going to be running this session for us. Trista. Hey, everybody. Let's see. Is this, it's on, perfect. Um, this is easy, this is like talking to family, so I'm excited to be with all of you here today. Um, I'm Trista Harris. This QR code takes you um, to the website of Future Good. We've been giving away copies of the book Future Good, which teaches you how to use the tools that I'm talking about today. Um, we had initially said that we were giving away electronic copies of the book during the pandemic, and now we realize the pandemic's never gonna end. So you can get your copy there. Um, I'm a philanthropic futurist. I'm the president of Future Good. I've worked in nonprofits and foundations since I was 15 years old. Uh, later, I'll tell you about how I got to this place about caring about the future so deeply. But first, I wanna give you a little bit of context about this unique moment that we're living in. So there's a saying, and it's meant to be a curse. May you live in interesting times. We are living in a time of rapid change and decline. Uh, we're living in a time of pandemic and racial reckoning, school shootings, the slow collapse of democracy, the sometimes fast collapse of democracy. Uh, we're, pissing, we're, we're passing the tipping point. <laughs> we're also pissing the planet, but that's fine. <laughs> On climate change, we are very much living in interesting times. This is also a really incredible time um, of difficulty for people that work in the social sector. So I work really closely with nonprofits and foundations, and what I hear from their staff is this is the hardest work of my career. They're working on all the problems that I previously mentioned, but they're often doing it with less resources and fewer staff. People have really sucked it up since 2020, and I think they have hit the wall where they feel like they can't do any more work. And as uh, Fred said yesterday, um, this has been the greatest leadership challenge of many of our careers. I'll give a really personal example. So I grew up in Minneapolis and lived in Minneapolis for many years until about a year and a half ago where I escaped from the frozen tundra and moved to California, which has been fantastic. Um, but when I lived in Minnesota, Many of you probably saw live the murder of Philando Castile, um, who was uh, murdered by a police officer, and his partner uh, used Facebook Live to document uh, what had happened after the shooting. Uh, Philando Castile worked in the lunchroom of my son's preschool. Uh, he was known as Mr. P to the kids. He would make sure that um, kids that did not have lunch money would um, still be able to get something to eat, and he was uh, a really fantastic person. And in the Twin Cities, where we've had a number of uh, police shootings, as you know, um, uh, we felt like this was the case where everything was going to break open. And an elected official told me, it's like they finally shot Jesus. I feel like we're here. He worked in a school. He was a registered gun owner. We were waiting for the NRA to jump in. Um, and that did not happen, as you know. The police officer wasn't charged. The only person that was charged in relationship to this case uh, was Philando's, uh, I'm, Philando Castile's cousin, who uh, was protesting and helped to shut down a freeway and serve jail time. And so out of all of this, the only person um, that, that served time was a family member of Philando Castile. Our governor, understood the sort of um, boiling point that the state was at and started a governor's council on law enforcement and community relations. And the committee was half community members and half police and our purpose was to find a path forward. What is it that we need to be able to move forward? Um, the facilitator asked me to do some of the future work that we're gonna talk about a little bit later. And it is the hardest facilitation that I've ever done. I think I probably aged 10 years on that meeting. Uh, because we could not agree on anything. There was, when we would come to the meetings, we would sit on different sides of the table. And what we finally landed on, our only point of agreement, is that we wanted everybody to get home safe. We wanted police to get home safe. We wanted community members to get home safe. And what we agreed to as a committee was a significant investment in uh, money for police training. 
and it's tied to a, a transportation tax that will increase over time. It is an opportunity for every police officer in the state to receive diversity, equity, and inclusion um, training. It is an opportunity to uh, help police better understand mental health crises and also understand that black people are not a danger. And so it was a hard process, but at the end of it, we felt like we have, we have moved towards that place of justice. Just a few short years later, all of you saw uh, George Floyd being murdered on primetime television in Minneapolis in the neighborhood that I grew up in. Um, he was murdered by a police trainer while he was training new officers. Um, and so when the fire started uh, in Minneapolis, uh, the Star Tribune, the local paper, reached out to me and many other community members that had been a part of this very long and hard process to find a path forward. And um, what they said to me is, we want people to understand how hard you worked and that there really is a plan and that if they could just all go home and you know be quiet, we will, <laughs> we will fix this. Uh, and I said, you didn't call me until the city started burning down and it seems like it's working. So if if that is what it takes for you to pay attention uh, to what has been at a boiling point in the society, then I don't care if Target has to rebuild. I, Target will be fine. I'm not worried about Walgreens. Uh, what I am worried about is the black people in this community um, that may not survive another day given the police force that we have here. And, and when I was moving from Minneapolis uh, to California, I was cleaning out all my papers and downsizing and doing all that empty nester stuff. And I found a, a note. I was working with a national foundation at that time and they had said, could you come talk to us uh, about what's happening on the ground? We're trying to figure out how to engage and I think you would have a really unique perspective given all this experience. And so I found my handwritten notes for that conversation and it looked like a crazy person on the corner <laughs> with the sign. It was like the white supremacists are burning down the library and the police don't answer the phone and we don't need a police department, they can go to hell. Uh, and I was like, is this what I told the board of this national <laughs> foundation? Um, and I think with distance, what that has allowed me to see is we've been carrying a lot of stuff on our backs in this process, and we have not processed that trauma. Um, we have not been thoughtful about the people part of this transformation and change, and what I think is that futurism tools give you the space to both process what has happened and then to build the new. And so you have heard a lot um, in the last couple of days about a lot of the challenges that are being faced. You've heard about some of the opportunities as well. Our time together today is really about dreaming about what we want that future to look like, not what we're terrified that it might become, but in our highest hopes, what could that future look like? Because that is the only way that change happens. So I think a, a different future is possible, and this is one of my uh, favorite quotes. Another world is not only possible, she's on her way, and on a quiet day I can hear her breathing. I think that we are in this space where we're just on the edge of what's coming next and what that possibility is, but we have to give that future room to grow. So instead of the future that I described previously, um, what if instead we asked community members to describe their ideal future? It might start out really small. It might be self-serving, like a kid asking for an ice cream shop in their neighborhood. That's the most self-serving thing that I can think of. But maybe those ideas grow and build. And first there's a few community members and then dozens and then hundreds that start to imagine what they'd like their neighborhood to look like in the future. And they start to radically imagine what a new future could look like. Maybe many of them have never been asked before what success would look like in their community. And maybe those sparks of ideas start to create alignment and then action and those ideas create a point on the horizon where the entire community is driving towards that same picture of the future. And suddenly that ideal future becomes a reality. So what if instead in that process, foundation and nonprofit staff learn how to show up differently, not as gatekeepers, not as experts that are there to bring uh, solutions, but as resource mobilizers and connectors who can help the community's vision of success uh, and the community's vision of the future come true. 
maybe instead of that work for those people that work in foundations and nonprofits feeling draining and stressful, it instead feels meaningful and regenerative. And suddenly we have a future where foundations, nonprofits are suddenly meeting their missions and everybody is working collectively towards the same future. That's exactly what happened with one of Future Good's clients, uh, Camden Town, which envisioned what a neighborhood in North Minneapolis, which is a, a predominantly African-American community, would look like if it harnessed the strengths of the black community that has been underinvested in for generations. This visioning process led to millions of dollars of redevelopment in just a couple block area. And all of those ideas were based on what community members wrote on a chalkboard during a national night out. I see time and time again that when foundations and nonprofits use a future frame for their work um, and develop a picture of what success looks 50 years in the future, if you are fully successful in meeting your mission, what does the world look like and what would you have to look like in that future for that to be possible? That distance allows a couple of things. One, all of you are very busy people. And if I asked you, what can you do next year to end racial inequality? You would say, okay, <laughs> I, have a very, I have a very full plate. I can add one or two things, but I can't, I can't do much to move the needle forward. But if I asked you 50 years in the future, number one, it's not your problem. You're not gonna be in your jobs 50 years from now. Uh, it is about legacy and transformation and what you're leaving behind for future generations. And then suddenly you dream big about what that future could look like. Suddenly you create the space for something very different. And you don't worry about who's gonna get credit or who has to do the work. What you worry about is what is that picture gonna look like and what is the clear future that I'm creating? I think the challenge in many of your organizations is that everybody is working very hard with a completely different view of the future of what they're trying to create. And when you're in boardrooms and when you're in staff meetings and you can't understand why people aren't aligned, it's because you each have a very different view or a slightly different view of what the future looks like. And so what a future frame gives you is a clear point on the horizon that you're all pushing towards together. And what I have found um, is that for organizations that have this 50-year vision of the future, it doesn't take 50 years to get there. It usually takes about five to seven years for that picture of the future to become true. What you needed was a long enough runway to imagine something different, and you needed something exciting enough on the horizon that you are willing to do something different today to make that future happen. And you're gonna stop doing the things that are not aligned with that future, which creates the space for something new to happen. So I told you before that I would uh, tell you how I started my futurism learning journey. Um, I had my very first job running a foundation. I was so excited. You know, new jobs, everything shiny and new. And then a couple of months and you see all the cracks, all the things that they did not tell you during the interview process that are broken. Uh, we were a community foundation that relied on our donor base to support us. And our donors were taking a wait and see approach to a, a new black woman that was running this organization. And that is not a good place to be when you need to be raising money to be able to, to create change. Um, and during that time, it felt like the market was getting a little soft and everybody was sort of waiting to see what was happening. I was frantically trying to, to raise these dollars. And I got a call from our investment advisor. And he said, don't panic, which is a perfect time to panic. <laughs> and uh, what he said is our endowment had lost 50% of its value. This was 2008. Um, and uh, we had tried to be a good funder that made multi-year grants, which means that we did not have any new money to give organizations. Uh, and I was positive we were gonna close down. And our grantees were working on racial justice and economic justice, and they needed our support more than ever, and we did not have any dollars to give them. And every single morning, I dreaded going to work because I did not have a strategy besides crushing anxiety, and that was not serving me well in this process. Uh, at the same time, uh, my son that was a toddler at that point, there was a bookstore in uh, Minneapolis that has animals running around. There's bunnies and dogs and rabbits, and sometimes they bring a pony in. It's ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> so he wanted to go to this place, and then he didn't want to leave this place, obviously. And they had one full-size chair in the corner. It's kind of like school conferences where you're in the little kitty chair. They have one full-size chair and a pile of books that other parents have left behind as they're sort of trapped in this children's paradise. And uh, one of those books was called Flash Foresight. And it was about how to get a business advantage during times of crisis using the tools of futurism. And I was like, this is a time of crisis. <laughs> tell, tell me more. 
uh, I read that book front to back and realized that the tools of futurism were what our grantees needed in this moment to imagine something different. And so we started bringing those tools to our grantees and we said to them, many of you are not gonna be open two years from now. We don't, we don't have money to give you. Every foundation in town is pulling back on the work. You already had very small budgets. We understand that you will not be here, but we'd love for your work to continue. So what would that look like? What is the shared picture of the future? And as a social justice funder, what we often did is let's plant thousands of seeds and see what blossoms. What we had to do during this time is let's pick a singular view of the future and let's all start to work towards that. And so our grantees did, and they jumped all in, and they were really excited about figuring out what was after this terrible moment. And so in the couple of years that followed, our grantees got 10 legislative wins, the most in our organization's history. All of our groups were small groups led by people of color that were doing community organizing work. Uh, they got wins on things like alternative teacher certification to diversify Minnesota's teaching force. Uh, we were able to stop a voter ID effort. We got a first in its country homeowner's bill of rights, and we got marriage equity in the state of Minnesota. And so all of this lit a spark in me that the tools of futurism put in the hands of people that do good for a living is an unstoppable tool. Futurism is often used by business leaders to understand what you want to buy next. Um, many of the kind of foresight practices that maybe some of you have heard about in your organization are from the Shell Oil Company. So Shell Oil understands that when oil disappears, they don't have an oil company. And so they are very interested in understanding future trends and what those mean. Um, it's also used by the government, mostly the military, mostly to figure out who's going to hate us next. And so. Uh, when you go to futurism conferences, those are the people that are in those spaces, military contractors and big companies that are trying to figure out how to take advantage of these future trends. Who is not in those spaces are people of color, women, people that do good for a living. And I think that these tools are powerful in our hands. So since that experience, I've been on my own futurism learning journey to learn as much as I can about what's coming next and how to translate that for people in the field. Um, to give you an idea, I've interviewed experts in dozens and dozens of fields, human genome mapping, health eth ethics, disaster first response, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, space tourism. I learned about that one when I snuck onto Richard Branson's island, which is for a different talk. Um, <laughs> I've also studied strategic foresight at Oxford and did some work with the Institute for the Future and Singularity University. The purpose of all of that is to make sure that you have a clearer picture of what's next and that you have the skills to be able to transform what the future is gonna look like. Um, so uh, back in 2018, I decided to start uh, my company, Future Good, because I felt like the pace of change was getting faster in the social sector and I felt like we were unprepared for what was coming next. Um, our purpose is to help visionary leaders build a more beautiful and a more equitable future. Uh, we help foundations develop those 50-year strategies to understand what that impact is gonna look like and what is the rolling three-year work plan to actually get to that future. And then we help nonprofits solve some of the most challenging issues in our society using these future tools. Uh, I'm gonna share uh, one of those tools with you today. So a little bit of context. Um, developing a new picture of the future or predicting future trends is not magic eight ball work. I know that's what my mom thinks, but uh, there are a, a set of tools that are actually really easy to use. And often when I talk to folks that have worked e either on the corporate side with professional futurists or more foundations are working with professional futurists, they say, well, we talked to a futurist about how we do this, and they said, it's too difficult for you to understand. We will, we will describe to you what's coming next. Um, that is nonsense. Futurists make a lot of money telling you what's coming next, and they don't want you to do it. It is a very simple set of tools that if you practice and use them consistently, it will help you not just predict what's coming next, but also shape what's coming next. Um, the other thing that I think is, is really interesting in this trajectory in the last couple of years is in 2018, when I started Future Good, um, I spent that first year through 2019 speaking at conferences and convenings like this about futurism and why it was an important tool. And people would say, this is, 
this is very interesting. I am so glad you are doing this work. I am very busy with the present. I don't have any time for the future, uh, but you keep going. Um, when 2020 happened, I think we all became very clear that the future can look very different than we've anticipated and that we actually have a responsibility in the social sector to understand what these possible future trends are so that we are more prepared to support grantees, community partners, and our own organizations as we do this work. A recent study from BetterUp Labs found that the most important skill for leaders today is future thinking skills. These skills, skills help you thrive and stay resilient in the face of uncertainty, and there is a lot of uncertainty now. Uh, they did a survey of 1,500 U.S. workers, and what they found that was that those that were high in future-mindedness reported 34% less anxiety, 35% less depression. Um, they're more optimistic about the future. They are more productive, and they have greater life satisfaction. Um, as Tahira said yesterday, black people always create the future. We are constantly thinking about what's next. And a, a colleague of mine, David Bickham, um, says that um, black people innately draw the picture of what the future is going to look like. He says that the I have a dream speech is a futurist speech. You are describing a future state that does not exist and you're helping other people see what that looks like. And so this, this name futurist and futurism might feel unusual. You are doing it every single day and you innately are understanding what's coming next. I think there's another reason why futurism and future thinking skills are really important in the sector. Our field exists to change the trajectory of the future. Every time you fund a new program or start a new program, every time you propose a public policy, you are trying to bend that arc. You are trying to create a different picture of what's possible and what's next. Uh, Future Goods developed a, a number of tools. We have a strategic planning framework that helps people approach strategic planning. Instead of looking backwards and seeing what's happened previously, you anchor your plan in the future. You ensure that the work that you are doing is transformative and not incremental. Um, we also have a program called Future Good Studio where we train people on how to use this futurism work. Because when I first started this, um, I, people would say, we've never met a futurist before. I want the field to be a place where at your table, somebody is a futurist about the future of early childhood education or the future of black people globally or the future of immigration. You're all experts in those areas. Adding this set of tools is another set of tools in your toolbox that allows you to create transformation and change. So today I'm gonna to share our model for making time for the future in the present. There's a saying today is giving you clues about tomorrow. There's another, the future is already here. It just isn't evenly distributed. Um, one of the most important futurism tools is trend sensing. This is paying attention to what's happening right now because it's giving you a picture of what the future could look like. Um, I often take uh, usually groups of funders, but sometimes funders and elected officials and nonprofit leaders to things called field trips to the future, where you go someplace else in the world that is already living the future that you want to see. Um, one of the examples is a, a group of early childhood educators. We went to Sweden to see the future of early childhood education. Sweden is a place that invests in its children. Um, the United States is not one of those places. I don't want to break it to anybody, but um, to be able to see a fully funded early childhood system and what that means for society allows us as folks that are trying to move change forward to have a picture of what it could look like and to know that it is worth the work and the effort to actually make it happen, that the hard transformative work actually leads you to a better society and a better future. So I'm gonna share some of the trends that we're paying attention to at Future Good right now that I think will impact the future of your work. So I'll start with our uh, future of philanthropy model. So uh, back in 2016, I adapted a model that was about future of nonprofits that the Institute for the Future had developed uh, so that it was about the future of philanthropy. And I had expected that to be a 10-year model. And then the pandemic happened and the racial reckoning happened and those things made the future of philanthropy happen faster than I anticipated. That often happens where there is an outside force that can push you faster to the future that you've envisioned. And so the way that this two curves model works is that in this top left, this left hand side is about the present, the right hand side is about the future. 
So in this top left-hand side, this first curve is the way that philanthropy has worked. The way that Andrew Carnegie did it um, is what it looks like within many philanthropic institutions today. Top-down governance, usually a board of directors that's disconnected from the community that they are funding. Uh, very deliberate processes for the letter of inquiry and then the application and here are all the steps and everybody knows the way forward. Very small scale, often supporting one organization at a time to create change. Explicit metrics, we've all gotten fantastic at logic models. If we invest X, Y is gonna happen. Um, incremental impact, which is I, I think the biggest frustration of people that work in philanthropy. We have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in this issue and it is getting worse. And so we keep on plotting forward, but the pace of change is so fast that things are getting worse faster than we're able to make it better. And lastly is tempered speed, which is a nice way to say foundations take a very long time to make decisions. <laughs> what we also have in the present are these signals of the future. And these are things that are giving us hints about what the future of philanthropy is gonna look like. I think the most important is uh, pandemic grant making processes. We were working with a number of foundations before the pandemic about what an equity frame looked like across their entire foundation, including their grant making practices. And what each of them told us is it's actually a very complicated system. We've got the software, we can't be messing things up and moving them around. We have a timeline, here's when the board meets. We can't do anything different in the grants management piece. Every single foundation in the country changed its grant making processes in 2020. I can't think of one where their process didn't look different because we knew that the need was there and we knew that we needed to show up differently. And so what we have learned in this process is we actually can change our grant making practices. We actually can do things differently. We can be fast, we can be responsive, we can get rid of um, reporting requirements if they're not useful. We can give general operating support. We have done those things and we can continue to do those things. And so we're not gonna unlearn it. We lived it, we saw it, and now we know that it's possible. Uh, next is a shift to the racial equity frame. So we really had a great panel yesterday where they were talking through this leadership moment that existed in the field. And we had to show up differently and we had to use a real racial equity frame for our work. And I think one of the reasons that that happened is that when George Floyd was murdered, normally the attention would be on the police department. Maybe people would get mad at the mayor. Uh, we were all at home and we had a lot of time and space to go, you know what, actually all this is really messed up, including the foundations. What are you guys doing? Um, normally we don't get negative attention. You give away money. What could be bad about that? A lot of things folks know that have worked in the field for a long time. Uh, and I think there were questions in the community about what is philanthropy's role in exacerbating these disparities that create these sort of conditions where uh, somebody gets murdered on TV. And I think that we in the field had this feeling for a long time that there are challenges with the ways that we do grant making and who gets the big grants and who gets the small grants and who do we decide doesn't have enough capacity that we actually have a responsibility to do things differently. And so I think that is an, a really important signal of what's coming next in the field. Um, next, Dr. Ross talked a little bit about the social impact bonds, which were a really important moment in the field where we figured out that the 5% was not the limit of what we could do. And that actually we needed to harness uh, different tools to create change. And when I saw the, the notification that that had happened, I was in my little home office screaming and yelling. And uh, my daughter that was in college, but it really in my basement during that time, um, <laughs> I was like, what is going on? I was like, there's a social impact bond. And she's like, I do not know what you're talking about. And I'm like, it's very exciting. I know you don't understand, but it's very exciting because uh, what it does is create space for a different path to create change. And we have been missing that in the field for a very long time. And so I think what this has taught us is that there actually are a lot more tools at our disposal. So what's coming next? Um, in this second curve of philanthropy, I think the really uh, important piece is philanthropy as a collaborator. So I think philanthropy is going to deepen its role in ci civic engagement by supporting nonprofits that are working on community issues through advocacy and organizing. I think Michigan's Governor's Office of the Foundation Liaison is a fantastic example of this, and they've been doing that for about 20 years. Um, there are a lot of efforts to replicate that around the country where there's a real partnership between government and philanthropy to create change. Uh, regenerative philanthropy will take root. 
the Justice Funders has developed a really comprehensive model of what a transition from extractive to regenerative philanthropy looks like. Um, often when I talk to nonprofit folks, they're like, what is extractive philanthropy? Um, I think it is when your foundation's purpose is to make the world a better place and 200 organizations spend 40 hours each filling out your very long grant application and you give away one $10,000 grant. The world is a worse place because you decided to give away $10,000. That is extractive philanthropy. Um, regenerative philanthropy is when everybody is better off because of this interaction and this connection. And I think there's a, a couple of uh, thoughts from the Justice Funders model that I think are gonna have an impact on this future of philanthropy. Um, one is authentic partnerships with grantees where communities impacted by problems are developing solutions. We've seen a lot of that in our, our previous panels. The expertise is there and you need to harness that expertise to be able to create transformation and change. I also think we're moving towards a time of less due diligence processes and more time on relationship building and connection. I think AI is gonna be uh, really connected to this and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, next is seeing past the grants. So during the pandemic and the economic downturn, foundations have been paying a lot more attention to how their full operations impact the communities that they care about. I think we're gonna continue to see foundations uh, make their values come true through their operations and all of their aspects of their foundations. A couple examples. Uh, more foundations are gonna move their investment strategy screens from not investing in harmful things like tobacco and for-profit prisons to improvement of issues that they care about like carbon mitigation. I think a larger percentage of foundations will have and actually use diverse vendor policies, uh, ensuring that foundation resources are spending a lot more time in local communities and that those dollars actually benefit marginalized communities. Businesses owned by people of color are much more likely to hire people of color. Local businesses are much more likely to spend dollars within local community. Um, my business has a lot of rules about how we spend our money. When we are convening for foundations, you're eating local food, you're in a place that's owned by a person of color, we make sure that all of those pieces are lined up. You don't get that when you're working with a, a big, huge company because it's all about profit margins. And so I think when foundations are trying to create this transformation and change, think about not just the grant making, but all the other ways that you're investing and spending money. Uh, HR departments are going to uh, interrogate their hiring practices to better understand where biases live in those practices, and then they're going to rebuild them. And I think we're moving towards a future where foundation assets are 100% mission and program related invested. I think it is silly that our dollars are sitting in the stock market, creating the conditions that we are fighting against with 5% of our funds. I talk to a lot of investment committees and they say, well, we have a fiduciary responsibility. It is our job to ensure that these dollars continue to grow. What we have to change around those tables is that fiduciary responsibility and mission responsibility have the exact same weightiness. It cannot be that the place that most of our resources are sitting is not aligned with those dollars. And so I think when we move to a future where every single dollar is moving your mission forward, what that might look like is new opportunities for affordable housing in your local community because you're investing in places like LISC and other organizations that have those investment opportunities. I think what it means is a lot more dollars um, for entrepreneurs of color to have small business loans. The biggest challenge for businesses to scale is that they don't have the resources to do so. And I think the piece that's really interesting for my business that was just me, I was the only person, uh, and then in the end of 2020, when every foundation and nonprofit realized that their strategy wasn't gonna work anymore because the world was different, and they were like, Trista, did you talk to us about an equitable future? I think we're supposed to do that now. How would we do that in strategy? Um, and I had to grow my team. The only way that I could grow my team is because I got a PPP loan from the government. So I had the spaciousness to actually be able to bring on people. I couldn't have done that otherwise. There is not angel funds that are looking to, there's a couple, but there's not many angel funds that are investing in small businesses led by people of color. And so when foundations open up those resources, huge transformation happens. And last is transformative impact. 
so how do we solve the problems that we're working on instead of making things 5% less terrible, which I think is a lot, of our, a lot of our current work. So the important part of this model is not, here's the old way philanthropy worked and here's the new way. Philanthropy has existed since the beginning of humankind because there are a lot of things about it that are amazing. And within each of the philanthropic institutions in the room, um, there are things that you need to bring forward to the future. It's different for every organization, but uh, I think some of the common ones are uh, donor intent, uh, deep relationships with community and skilled staff. Those are the things that move forward with you to the future. The challenge is that these two curves are intersecting. So you have all of the pressure of the outcomes of the second curve of philanthropy, but you have all the systems, processes, and tools of this first curve of philanthropy. And so your work is to move from system by system, process by process, moving from that first curve to the second curve. And more importantly, within each of your institutions, your role is to understand what that ideal future looks like for your institution and to have a clear picture of what's next. So I'll share a couple other trends that we're paying attention to in this moment. Um, one is that disruption is the norm. I've heard a lot of folks say, especially in the last couple of years, I can't wait till things go back to normal. I am so sorry to break it to you. Um, we are living in a time of exponential change where change gets more intense and faster as we go. That is really an unfortunate time for us to be born into humanity. Like it would have been super cool if we came in when we were hunters and gatherers and your village is 100 people and everything's linear and you can only go as far as you walk. That's, that's not our time. Uh, we are living in a time where we are globally connected and this pace of change gets faster and faster. And I think instead of holding on to this idea that we often see in politics, make America great again is about slowing down this pace of change. It's about, uh, I have a trend that I often share um, that Nazis really hate robots. Um, this idea of immigrants are taking our jobs and people of color are ruining everything. Uh, a robot has your job. There, that's, that is the difference. You are, you are living in a time where artificial intelligence is changing what uh, the workforce looks like, but we don't talk about it. And so there is an old story that we are telling about who is responsible, and there is this call to action to bring us back to a time where black people stay in their place and you know, a man can be a man and support his family and buy a house in the suburbs making $20,000 a year. Um, that is not the time that we are living in. And so within each of your organizations, it is so important to have a point on the horizon that you are working towards so that you can harness this volatility and get to that future faster. You also have to have really strong values during this time. So when you are faced with multiple choices, your values need to be the things that hold you strong. Next is artificial intelligence as a partner. So Dr. Ray Kurzweil, who's a futurist that's really great at predicting exactly when technology changes happen, uh, has predicted that artificial intelligence is going to achieve human-like intelligence before 2029. I think with the launch of ChatGBT in 2022, we have already hit and surpassed this point. This has vast impacts for nonprofits, foundations, the social sector, the world as a whole. Um, and we need to quickly learn how to partner with these tools and train these tools to create the future that we want to see. A lot of people worry about AI replacing uh, jobs and work, and I, I think um, there are some ways that it's completely transforming work. I think within our sector, what's more likely is that we will use AI to replace repetitive tasks that we are doing in the field, and we will use that extra time to deepen relationships and community and to be innovative about what's next. AI cannot create anything new. All it does is plagiarize what's already been developed. It takes people's brain power to create new ideas, and so use this new space to figure out new paths forward. Um, I think in a future, um, nonprofits could use AI to uh, write grant applications given public available in Does that work? Perfect. Um, 
Some of you have already seen AI grant applications. I know you have. It's uh, it's usually very flowery language that is not actually saying anything. Uh, I think the, the tools will get better and better as we go. Um, I think that philanthropy needs to be a key partner in uncovering bias in AI systems and to push for artificial intelligence and robot taxes. I think that is the most important challenge of our time. And if we don't get in front of this, companies are not going to give up that big increase in profit that's happened by not employing people. What makes me hopeful about AI is the Industrial Revolution moved us from 80 hours a week of work to 40 hours a week of work. I think that this AI and robotics revolution can move us from 40 hours a week of work to 20 hours a week of work. I think if all of us are really honest about our social media usage, we're probably already at 20 hours a week of <laughs> actual useful work, but I, you know, work that out with yourself, your boss, whatever that takes. <laughs> so what we need is universal basic income to fill that gap. We need jobs that pay an actual living wage for those 20 hours a week of work. And we need to encourage organizations to not continue to try to squeeze everything we can out of people and have less people around the table. Uh, what, we, what we really need is this frame around 20 hour work weeks and the rest of the time people are raising their kids and taking care of elders and being good community members and that we learn how to take care of each other as human beings in society. All right, I'm gonna stop there and open it up for uh, questions that folks have. Um, my team likes to joke that I have an idea about uh, future trends about almost any issue that organizations are working on because we're very much generalists. Um, otherwise, I've got ideas and resources that I can send you to. The other thing that I'd encourage you is if you, either these trends that I've shared or ones that you hear me talking to, to folks about here, if you disagree, there's often opposite things that are happening at the same time. And so we want to hear about that too. Yeah. Do we have two mics or do we just have the one? Good eye, good eye. So I thought the oops, sorry the point about AI and and reducing the work week was really really interesting, um, and I'm so I, I saw this comedian online who said you know when we thought about technology what we thought was like technology was going to make our work our life easier so that we could like paint and and write songs and what's happened is it's, uh, it's AI is writing, writing songs writing and song. painting and we're Terribly. working harder and um, so and and. And then I guess like looking at the sort of ethos of the private sector, what it's done is that the cheaper, we also were told that the cheaper it became to produce things, the less it would cost us. And what we found is like, oh, there's like more profit to be made. Nice. So inflation is, and I'm, yeah. I, I, I understand like that's the opportunity in front of us. Um, but I don't know the switch that we flip yeah. to kind of get there. And I guess even looking at us as being nonprofits and, and philanthropic institutions, um, you know, I think we, yeah, just like where, what is, how does our sphere of influence actually push those folks to do those sort of things? Yeah, a hundred percent. So one, I think there's a lot of exciting change on that front. Um, companies decided in the 1960s or 1970s that the purpose of a corporation was to maximize shareholder value. That was a theory. And then they were like, yeah, that, and then everything collapsed. And so... Um, you can also decide, just like William said, foster care was developed in two years. The idea that shareholder value is the most important thing in society was developed by a white guy writing a paper, and people were like, yeah, that sounds good, cool. And, you know, everything falls apart around us. We can decide something different, and a lot of corporate leaders have found it's not serving them well either because a bunch of broke people can't buy their products. And so if you have maximized shareholder value so much, that there's nothing left. Um, there's not going to be a society. Uh, the, the piece that's really interesting to me, my uh, son lives in Germany now, and after I dropped him off, I went to the south of France, which is Le Bleu, and there's a coast, and there was a yacht that had an emotional support yacht. It's like the yacht was so big that it needed a smaller yacht so that the helicopter could land on that one and they could pull the yacht into the other one. And I was looking at this and somebody, I was like, what, is that a cruise ship? No, that's some guy's boat, okay. Um, so they're sort of describing it to me 
And I was like, we need better taxes. What is happening? Like, th this, seeing this should not be like uh, a surprise that our tax system is broken. And I think that, one, we need to push corporate leaders to um, understand their societal responsibility. There's actually a big push towards conscious consumerism, where when we have choices about what companies to support, we are going to support the companies that we feel like are making the world a better place. Um, and so companies understand this. They think what we don't notice is the mechanism. So during the pandemic, when prices went up and all the products got smaller, and they're like, inflation, oh my gosh, supply chain, it's such a big issue. What they were saying on their shareholder call, calls is, we've learned how to maximize volatility, which is taking advantage of a crisis to increase your prices. Um, and they're hitting the limit of what that looks like and what's, what's possible. And so I think we need to continue to push back. And we, as a field, need to have conversations about taxes. We don't talk about that because our, our donors are folks that will be impacted like that. And we've sort of tried to, to stay out of that issue. I think we have a responsibility. So society is on the line. And um, it is for the guy with the emotional support yacht, he's going to be fine. It's, I'm, I am not worried about how his day to day is going to change if he is at a 50% tax rate after the first billion dollars or whatever, he'll be great. Uh, but I think we have really stayed out of that fight and that conversation, and we can't continue to do that. Who else? We need a mic over here, sorry. Okay. Gracias, muy buenos días. Uh, gracias por la excelente exposición. Oh, I need my um, headset. <laughs> Can I use yours? It doesn't work. Does somebody have a headset that works? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry, go ahead. Gracias por la excelente exposición. Eh, dos preguntas. Eh, estamos en un momento en que los países, las, las regiones, están en... Eh, adecuando a su infraestructura jurídica e institucional para abordar la cuestión de la inteligencia artificial. Eh, la reciente ley de la Unión Europea, que está próxima a consolidarse, la orden ejecutiva del presidente Biden, eh, los países están creando instituciones de control, eh, etc. Eh, ¿qué, ¿Qué rol cree usted que puede jugar su organización y la filantropía en general en este momento en lo que concierne a eh, grupos sociales como eh, los afrodescendientes para eh, que puedan ser eh, incorporados, digamos, sus intereses dentro de estos procesos. Esa eh, es la, la primera eh, pregunta. La segunda es, eh, en la perspectiva de eh, avanzar eh, en el proceso de inclusión, es decir, tenemos la realidad de que mientras los niños en nuestros países, en nuestras comunidades, están tratando de aprender a leer y escribir, eh, en ciertas latitudes otros niños están estudiando programación, lo que tiene un impacto, digamos, eh, profundo en eh, el tema de la desigualdad. Pero igualmente sabemos que por la vía remota se puede contribuir en los procesos de formación, por ejemplo, podemos implementar programas de formación de nuestros niñez en materia de programación en forma remota. ¿Qué recomendaría usted a ese respecto? Gracias. That's a great question. Um, so on infrastructure around AI, actually keep this up here. Um, one, I think it's great that we're having these conversations about what are the guide rails that we're putting around these tools? And I think we need to be a part of those conversations. Even if it feels new or uncomfortable, you have the values piece that's missing in these places. And so sit around those tables. There's a group of funders that is thinking about what equity and education looks like using AI tools and how to ensure that these tools um, support kids of color 
because they very easily could not. I talked to a group of ed educators uh, right when ChatGPT came out, and they were like, we're banning it in our schools. And I said, you're actually not. You're, you're banning it on school devices, and every kid that has a computer at home is gonna use it for homework, and those kids that can't afford it are not gonna learn how to use the most important tool that they will use in the workforce. So um, I think it's important that we create that space. You had a question about uh, black kids and technology. And I have a trend that I often share uh, about education where if you took, uh, this is a very US reference, but if you took Laura Ingalls Wilder from the Little House on the Prairie books, if you took her into a Target, she would lose her mind because there's like 50 shampoos and fluorescent light and there's a lot going on. Uh, but if you put her in a school, she would know exactly what to do. There's a teacher in the front, you listen, you sit in the desk, I'll tell you what you told me. Uh, our education system needs to transform and to change. And what gives me hope is that I think that black kids in particular are best positioned for what's coming next because what futurists in the education space need is the future of education is about um, utilizing and partnering with these new technology tools. It is about remixing two technologies and creating something different. And it's about cultural competency to be a part of a global workforce. Black children do that every single day. Anytime a new technology comes out, um, I, I was a part of a group to learn about AI prompts. And all that comes out of that group are different like HBCU people wearing different sweatshirts. And I was like, it, five minutes and we are all in this tool and we're figuring out the prompts and how to change it and whatever for our own uses. And so we're fantastic at using tech, new technology. I am concerned about things like broadband access and who has access to um, trainings and those sorts of things. But the second a new tool comes out, we are on top of it learning how to use it and we're shaping what it looks like moving forward. And so I think we'll do well there. Yes, we're gonna take one more question. Okay. It's not a question, but more of offering a resource. Uh, yeah. At the Caper Foundation, we, ha we yeah. released about two years ago our equitable tech policy that looks at the ecosystem from computer science in K through 12 all the way to uh, investment and venture capital, specifically how to leverage technology to close gaps of access. And especially on the mm -hmm. AI side of the house, um, if the call to action that I would actually uh, request here for the folks that are here, we need more foundations and funders who can help us center more racial equity in the AI development and investment. So I offer um, to be a resource to you all. We're part of the BP Harris's public interest uh, that has 10 foundations that are working on funding uh, national, uh, but also international efforts of how to create the safeguards. But we need you all, so uh, happy to connect because I think it, to your point, it's super, super critical and we need to be having these conversations with folks like you that are the experts. Perfect. There's, I, I will stick around afterwards. Um, there are a couple pieces that I wanna leave you with. Um, I think it is important that each of you build your futurism skills. And for those of you that are funders, give your grantees space to radically imagine the future. That is not what we have been doing. Um, we created Future Good Studio in partnership with Target. So I think Fred's uh, comments that he made earlier about anger being something that can move forward change. Uh, Target is a company that is based in Minnesota. They were right across the street from the police precinct where the officer was based that, that murdered George Floyd. And so all of the news was sort of showing burning police station and looted Target. And to Target's credit, what they said is, I think we actually have some responsibility in this. And it's, it is about one store, Target's gonna be fine. Uh, but what Target decided to do was to make a $2 billion commitment to black businesses by 2025. That is an immense commitment. And Future Good was one of the businesses that they picked in the first year. And they gave us two employee teams of about 20 people total that allowed us to create a learning program that teaches people how to use futurism in their work. And so um, a $2 billion commitment does not come from incremental change. $2 billion comes from a transformative moment and a company being ready to do something different because they know their values and they know the future that they wanna see. The piece that I will leave with you is that another future is possible and it needs you. 
It needs you to have a long-term future frame for what success looks like in your work. It needs you to spend time understanding future trends that impact the causes and communities that you care about. And it needs you to believe that a more beautiful and equitable future is possible and that you're willing to actually do the work to make it happen. Thank you for everything that you're doing to make tomorrow better than today.